Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know I'm the last speaker of the day. You guys are pretty tired, and I'm in between you and beer. So I will try and get through this as quickly as possible. Um, so like you said, my name is Ken Laporte. I run the search infrastructure team at Bloomberg. Uh, specifically, what we do is we provide search as a service to the rest of the company. Uh, I've been in the search domain space for about eight years, uh, and our team has been in existence for about three or four. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got started and uh, um, what we're doing and what's next. So a little bit about Bloomberg. Bloomberg is the world's largest provider of financial news and information. Our clients really rely on us to get uh, information to them as quickly and uh, with the greatest consistency and quality as possible. So uh, high-speed data uh, retrieval systems like search are really critical to that as our databases. But search is nothing new at Bloomberg. Search has been around for, since the beginning of the company, 30 plus years ago. So what happened? Well, there were originally a lot of different um, search architectures and technologies being used. Some of them commercial, some of them open source. Um, they were very difficult to maintain. How do you maintain uh, 20 different, different applications um, across all the teams? There was no consistency. There was uh, best practices that weren't being followed. There's a lot of custom code. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of sharing. Um, this was finally costly ma to maintain and almost impossible to evolve over time. So that's where we came in. We looked at some of the use cases that existed. We wanted to make sure that we were going to offer search as a service, but really try and show what we could do. So we picked a few different use cases. Uh, you can see the top left one is about mergers and acquisitions uh, and, the, and the, sorry, Top right and the bottom right is a geospatial search um, showing, di I believe this is different boats uh, in various waters. Um, and each of these had very distinct requirements. The mergers and acquisitions was heavily analytical data um, that we actually developed a custom component for solar. Uh, so it was really an interesting thing. But why solar? Well, we reviewed a bunch of different search engines and technologies. Um, Search, uh, solar was already heavily used at Bloomberg, so that was a big plus. There was a large community. Some people in this room actually uh, are probably committers or have worked on different uh, areas of solar. Uh, it was established and growing very, very quickly at the time. Finally, we, knew, we did some testing. We knew it was scalable. We knew it was stable and really working well for us. And Bloomberg as a whole, about the same time, really wanted to commit to open source. And this was very attractive to us. We wanted to not only uh, go into the solar and fix bugs and make minor tweaks, but actually build out new, in, new software, um, really contribute to the core, add major features. And since 4.5, we've had uh, new, uh, new features added in almost every release. And as of right now, we have three different uh, committers at Bloomberg. One of them is a PMC member. So a little bit more about search as a service. We designed it with our application teams, the people who are actually going to be using it. We talked to them, we found out what they needed, what they wanted, and with that, we built a very flexible middleware layer between solar and our users. Um, this allowed, allowed us to do a lot of really cool things. First, we simplified the interface to solar. We made it dead simple for them to get started, get using it. Um, but it also allowed a pass-through capability. Some people wanted to do anything they wanted good or bad, and just go ahead and go to town. So we had to support that. Um, and finally, we added some basic uh, monitoring and, and metrics to go with it. More on that later. So open for business. This is great. Uh, day one, we started off with three tenants, and over time, it increased dramatically. We did not anticipate this kind of growth. Um, so very quickly, we were adding hundreds of searches, uh, search and, uh, servers, handling thousands of queries uh, per second, um, indexing billions of documents a day. A lot of these mission critical to Bloomberg. And not only Bloomberg, but the financial industry overall. And then we realized it. We've made a huge mistake. We didn't r really think about a few things. We didn't think, how are we actually going to scale? How are we going to scale the uh, personal support that we've been offering tenants? Um, how are we going to really monitor and manage these collections? How, how are we going to handle the alarms? We were getting alarms daily. Um, when we were detecting things, we were getting problems reported to us by our clients. 
which is not what we want. We want to detect them before they, they know that there's a problem. Our configuration management was a mess. Um, I'll talk more about that. And finally, there were lots of known unknowns. We knew there were things wrong. We, we knew that there were problems, we just were having trouble identifying them. So the first thing that we talked about is our ecosystem. How do we fix this from the ground up? What's the, what's the most basic problem that we're having? And the first thing is ownership. People who were running their own search engines for a long time thought that they should own the search engine. They, others thought, hey, I'm just going to throw my data over, this, over, the, over the fence to these guys. They're going to own everything. They're going to manage everything. Some thought we'd even write their code for them. Uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> so where's the line? So what it came down to is that we became custodians of that, of that data. We made sure that the APIs and the services were all stable, and everyone was kind of happy with that. How do we plan for scale? Um, different groups were growing at different, different paces. We had people who were, uh, you know, they'd say, ah, oh, I think I'm just going to start off with a million documents, and before we knew it, they were at several billion, and we had to deal with issues like that. Um, and finally, educating our, our users. These, a lot of these guys came from databases. They had no experience with search. They didn't know anything about the specific data types, tokenization, relevance, or some of the features with solar or, and search engines in general, like faceting. Faceting was a new concept to a lot of people. Um, there were several talks about relevance today. Um, I see Mike over there who gave the LTR plugin talk this morning. Um, and Diego, too. Sorry. <laughs> um, we've spent a lot of time working on relevance, but a lot of that is also educating our users. So the first thing that we did to figure this out is we came up with kind of a four-step approach. The first, is a, the first step is a survey. We actually sit down and talk with everyone who wants to have a collection. We find out exactly what they want. We talk to them about their use cases, whether even a search engine is an appropriate use case for them. Uh, how quickly they plan on indexing data, what their queries look like, and we work with them to figure out how best to uh, structure all of that. Um, next, develop and test. Um, how are they actually going to get this out? Um, how can we make sure that it's, it's stable, reliable? Um, that's my job, to make sure that nobody ever finds the, an outage, uh, that we find out about it, we fix it before our clients know anything about it. Um, to do that, we help them follow some of the best practices. We developed code samples and, uh, that they can use and copy. Uh, we wrote really good documentation. And we did other things, like we, help, we hold regular office hours and have a support chat where people can come ask us questions whenever they want. We've really involved other application developers in our Bloomberg to come in, help, help each other out. And finally, we developed a search guild of people interested in search applications at Bloomberg, uh, not only for my team, the search infrastructure team, but throughout the company. The next step is validate and deploy. How do they know that what they created in dev is actually going to go to prod, it's actually going to work, and it's going to stand the test of time? The first step of this is hardware provisioning. I'm going to talk a, a bit more about that later, so I don't want to go too much into it, as, I'm, as are automated deployments. But one of the features that we started offering is hot and cold collections for some people who are interested. The ability is to index to one collection and, or two collections and flip after some quality control checks. This is a very new concept to some people, and they really found it very useful. Next, load testing. Load testing is an incredibly uh, important part to uh, my team as well as to the company. Um, what we want to make sure is whatever load they anticipate, we can not only handle that load, but we can handle that load in a disaster recovery situ situation. So if a data center is down, we can actually continue to service their client load even at peak. Um, finally, how do they grow? Some of these collections were created years ago. Features change, requirements change, and they want to, uh, and data changes. So how do you go from, hey, I, I, I want to, you know, I have this proof of concept, I'm going to index a million documents, and, you know, maybe run one QPS. How do I grow that up? How do I scale that to 1,000 QPS? How do I scale that to 10 billion documents? Um, how do we, and then how do we monitor that? And who controls that monitoring? So 
very often we'll find that, hey, this user really knows what they're doing. I want to put him in control of everything. That's going to let him start, stop, deploy, do everything. But with that also comes the ability to turn on alarms, turn them off, and handle those alarms when they come in. Which get, brings me to monitoring solar. How do we monitor solar? Um, first, we have a very large monitoring so, uh, footprint. It's huge. We have thousands and thousands of solar instances. The other thing is that, what do you monitor? So there's a number of things. First, uh, looking at cluster state is easy. You look at live nodes, you see what's up. Um, but we're also going deeper. We're actually constantly pinging solar from different nodes, making sure there's no network issues. We're monitoring the process health. We're making sure that that's, going, that's running well. And one level down, we're actually we run our own hardware, and we're monitoring that ourselves as well. We're taking all of that together um, to really create a, a good picture of the state of our system. This caused a problem. All of a sudden, we're monitoring all these things, and we're seeing false alarms. We're seeing, hey, this node went into recovery for five seconds a hundred times. Why? They weren't feeding anything. They weren't doing anything too special. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, so I really, I had a cool demo that I wanted to show you guys, but the demo gods did not allow me to do that. So <laughs> we're going to move on. Um, so we, cr we, we decided that we had to uh, take all that, those different ways that we were monitoring uh, solar and put them together to create an aggregate view. Um, these aggregated events really define whether or not there's a problem with our clusters. Um, it also allowed us to do something very interesting. It allowed us to um, delay alarms as well as to use that time that the al alarming was happening to uh, identify how serious of an alarm something is. You know, if a collection is down for two seconds, is that a problem? Or is, it, or is it a problem in a minute or 10 minutes or half an hour? Where that line is, we can define it. Um, and we created two, or I should say Keith, the guy back there, created two really cool tools uh, to help us monitor this. Uh, Night Owl, which is the back end process, uh, monitors all those things in solar, as well as other applications that we, that we manage, like Zookeeper, some of our own generic services. Um, and Watchtower, which with Night Owl allows us to visualize all these things. Um, as you can imagine, with hundreds of, of servers, how do you visualize these things? It gets very, very tight. There's a lot of information. Um, and we've thought of some very cool ways to kind of collapse views into different racks so that from one screen we can see, OK, everything that I have is good, or hey, here's the problem that I have. Um, this is in addition to automated alarms that go in that let me sleep at night. So some of the things that we found. First, memory issues was a huge, huge problem for us. Um, we're experiencing long uh, garbage collection pauses. A few things that we found, we were making our heaps too big. So we started keeping our heaps really, really small, even for large collections. Um, uh, for high ingest collections, make them even smaller. It really helped us out a lot. Uh, use G1GC as your garbage collector. This improved performance and stability significantly when we, when we switched over. Um, next, out-of-memory exceptions. Out-of-memory exceptions are almost unavoidable. You know, no matter how good you, you develop, eventually you're going to run into something like this. So one of the things that we use is the OOM killer. Uh, lets, you, lets us bring down a process, bring it right back up and, and resync and, and continue on. But we have monitoring and alerting on that. Should, that ha should we get too many OOMs or should it uh, interfere with cluster state? We know about it. We can action on it. But most of the OOMs that we found have to deal with uh, users doing sorting, filtering on non-doc value fields. So at the cost of some disk space, we started enabling doc values on a lot of these things. And all of a sudden, we were going from having these issues daily to uh, being a once-in-a-while once occurrence. With the garbage collection pauses, we also found that we were having long recovery times. Every time a collection would go and into a 15 or 20 second garbage collection pause, it would come back up and then start re uh, recovering for an hour. Why? That, that didn't make a lot of sense to us. Uh, after doing a lot of investigation, we found the transaction logs just don't hold enough information. Um, and you can see we, we created a few different uh, JIRA issues for those. And under high load, 
it would do a full recovery, which a full replication, which really wasn't working for us. Uh, there were a few other solar bugs that we addressed, and with those things, we had some massive stability improvements that we found. Configuration management was the next thing that we decided to tackle. And in fact, this is one of those challenges that we're still working on today. Um, back at the office, there's two guys right now toying away with this. The current process is we take what we want to define as our configuration and what the user defines as their configuration, put them together, and that kind of creates a composite. It allows them to, figure, to uh, define some things on their own while still allowing us to have uh, control. The problem with that, though, is versioning becomes very, very difficult. Um, there are some changes that you just can't roll back. Uh, we experienced this a lot when we moved from Solar 4 to Sol uh, Solar 5, where, hey, we just enabled dock values, and all of a sudden things don't work because some segments have dock values for a particular field, and some don't. Uh, some do and some don't. Um, so it was really good for some simple collections, but once we started doing some more complicated things, uh, the train kind of came off the rails and we needed some help. And finally, when you're merging these different configurations at different times, it's hard to say that you know, this version is exactly what I'm running in production. Um, that lack of provenance is, is really problematic for us and for our tenants, because when they say, hey, there was a problem, I deployed, some of, my, some of my nodes had this configuration, some had that. It was very difficult for us to understand. So we looked at it and we converted it to an SDLC process. Um, we basically said, okay, your configuration is gonna start living in a Git repository. Uh, we're gonna have, <clears throat> we're gonna build that repository with, with uh, Maven and Jenkins. We're gonna create artifacts that live in Artifactory, and then we're going to push those artifacts into ZooKeeper for Solar's use. Um, this is a process that we're, in, uh, that we're currently automating, but it also allows us to do some very cool things. So it allows us to validate the configurations through static analysis. It allows us to say, I see the change that you're making. This is a good change, or this is a known bad change. Uh, it also allows us to create unit tests with user-defined data. They can say, Here's a sample of my index. Here's a, a thousand documents. Here's the change before. Here's the change after. Is this going to work or is this going to break? Um, and the last thing is that we're working on completely automating this. One of our goals for this year is to really take, all, take us out of the whole process, um, empower our users, make it completely self-service for them. Ah, little, little puppies. Um, one of the issues that one of the other issues that we had is the substantial demand that we weren't ready for. Um, traditionally, Bloomberg uh, getting new hardware spun up is a very expensive uh, process with long lead times. That wasn't going to be acceptable to us. We wanted to really be able to drive those requirements, so we created a, a group of DevOps or SREs on our team, and they actually worked side by side with us to figure out exactly what we needed uh, and how to make it work. Um, it was completely from the ground up. Uh, we really streamlined it as much as possible. Uh, we used different tools like Vagrant, Jenkins, uh, and then monitor all this with Zabbix, as well as uh, pulling from Artifactory and stuff. Um, the last thing that I want to mention on this, and I know it's obvious, but it's, it, bears worth, it, it bears repeating. Better hardware is a better experience. Um, we did substantial tests with different hard drives. SSDs actually do make it better, big surprise. Um, but it makes it substantially better. Solar is very efficient at how it uses both disk and network. We have 20 gig uh, links between, our, uh, between nodes. And during a recovery, Solar will use all of that and pull it over. It will saturate the disks. It's really quite impressive when you see it. Um, So with that, we have all these servers, we have all these processes, and now, how do we manage these? That brings us to our, the next thing that we're, gonna, we're tackling. It's how do we containerize solar? How do we run all of our applications within containers? How do we make them work easier, faster, and better? Um, we want to make sure that things like ZooKeeper also run in a container. They run st uh, stable. 
and they really perform as well as they do as uh, as they do now on bare metal. Um, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that our tenants are completely self-service, that they have everything that they need to do any sort of configuration that they want, to do monitoring and manage their collections, almost like uh, on-prem cloud, if you will. And finally, we're making an, a number of improvements to solar. I'd mentioned that we created an analytics component. Well, for the last nine months, we've been working on a distributed version of that that uh, should be coming out soon. Uh, the Jira ticket is there. We've also done a ton of work on streaming. Uh, one of the committers on my team, Dennis Gove, has been working heavily on that, uh, and he continues to do that right now. And more, we're, st we're still looking at bugs, we're still looking at features, and we're still trying to figure out what the next thing is for us. All right, um, and with that, do you guys have any questions? First, let's give Ken a round of applause. Any questions? How much uh, time did it take, the whole process, from like the chaos to... Uh... <laughs> well, we're not at perfect yet. So we basically shut down creating new collections for about three months, where we said, OK, we really can't do any more deployments. We just have to fix some of the problems that we have. So we stopped everything. We said, OK, we're going to automate this step. We're going to let you do these things. Uh, so about three months to stable, and probably about two years after that, we've got, we've got in a really good state. Um, that said, I'm really hoping that by the end of this year, we can be completely, uh, our attendance can be completely self-sufficient. Uh, you know, they can go to some display and say, uh, I've purchased these servers, uh, I'm gonna spin up, you know, eight clouds with 12 collections, here are the configurations. Okay, it's, it's great, I wanna load test this now, I wanna move it out to production, and it'll be, and I wanna set these kind of alarms and, and these kind of metrics. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, and the team size? Uh, it start, that's a great question, sorry. Uh, it started off with three people, then was five. Uh, it started off with three people for a couple of years, uh, then five for a year, and I think it's now up to eight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, just one question regarding the containerization you're planning. I mean, I, I know the general theme, why, why one wants to do container, containerizations, but yep. what is your, why are you doing that? Are there particular reasons why you're planning for that? Sure, um, there's actually a lot of different reasons. The first one is that we want to be able to um, allow someone to say, on my desktop, on my laptop, I'm gonna spin up an entire search infrastructure. Um, I'm gonna create my own zookeepers, I'm gonna create a 12 node uh, solar cluster, and it's all gonna live locally. That's a lot harder to do without containers. Also, we have uh, collections that run on shared hardware. Um, this typically is not problematic, but we'd love to be able to do quality of service on, on collections. Uh, we'd also like to be able to scale them a little bit faster. So sure, we can bring up new Java processes, but it would be awesome if we had a scheduler where we can just say, hey, in this data center, we expect you know, 15 of these instances running in this data center. We're gonna do a load test, so we wanna have 30 of them running and just spin them up, let solar uh, do its replication and, and just run with it. Um, it's actually one thing that we're still investigating though with that is the performance of solar in a container. Um, I've seen some numbers where solar can take a 5% performance hit. Uh, something like that might not be acceptable to all of our tenants. They have hard requirements for how fast they have to deliver data. Uh, so that's something that we've got to look at. It might be, hey, you, you check a box, you, you'll run solar in a container. Hey, you want to have your own collection not in a container. You want to have it on bare metal. That's, that's for you too. Hi, um, I have a question about the SREs working with your team. Sure. And I'm wondering how much 
time it took for them to get familiar with the solar or did you uh, look for people already familiar or would you even say it doesn't matter, they don't, they don't care about solar? Uh, they care deeply about solar. Um, they, one of them has been on the team for a year and a half and I think he's the, he's the uh, first one that we hired. And although he does care about solar deeply, uh, he, he's no expert in it. Uh, you know, I will sit with him on a, on a, daily, uh, on a daily basis and you know, we'll qu parse out query logs and say, okay, this is why this query was running slow. You know, here's what we, do to, what we tell the tenants to fix it. Um, so we actually didn't search for a unicorn because you know, some, a, a DevOps and SRE who would, you know, really understood things like Vagrant and as well as search, that sort of thing, I'd rather just teach them on search. I can do that. Uh, I, I'd rather not teach them the more DevOpsy work. Does that answer your question? And that's work, that's work well for you. Yes. Um, I'd rather have his, his response was, and that worked well for us. Um, yes. I, I think it helps that we have three really, really bright guys uh, who I have a lot of faith in, and they have different experiences. One guy really, really. Uh, gets into the hardware. He's done all. We've evaluated at least 20 or 30 different types of hard drives, and he's found the perfect hard drive for our use cases. Um, others are higher up the stack, and one of them is more involved with, hey, let me create an API and, and a database to track all these servers and what's on what. Um, so from th from that perspective, that's really worked out. Uh, it also uh, lends them as themselves to be moved on to other things. So once we have a lot of this stuff automated, they can go work on other tasks, like we're, we're starting to toy around with them and data science and machine learning. So from that perspective, it's really worked out. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any kind of preliminary thoughts on how the containerization would, would work in terms of orchestration and things like that. We're evaluating a few different options. Uh, Kubernetes is, likely, is the most likely one right now uh, in terms of orchestration. But once it's in a container and, you know, there's, some, there's the whole idea of stateful sets, which may or not be a good idea for us, or we, maybe we just, for all, of our ta for all of our stateless services, we use Kubernetes. But for solar, we write our own scheduler that, that uh, knows a little bit more about solar um, and about how we want to run them, and we use that to schedule our containers. We're not exactly sure yet. We're still figuring that out. I have a question. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah, so you are uh, talking about streaming into solar. Yes. Uh, what are you using to do that, and um, what are the performance considerations for like generating an index that way? So I am not an expert on streaming yet. Um, we have one on our team, Dennis Gove. Uh, so as far as the performance, he has told me that he's done some uh, really impressive performance tests, uh, and I've seen the numbers, and they look really, really good. Um, I don't have any of them available to show you right now, uh, but if you want, we can talk after, and I, I can see if I can dig some up for you. The answer, the answer I think, to your question is it's impressive. Um, the exact answer, I guess, is also it depends. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of factors when you're talking about indexing. There's what kind of hardware am I running on? How many nodes do I have in my cluster? How many shards? How am I sharding my cluster? Um, you know, the same sort of uh, considerations that we're doing when you do a single, you know, update request. Cool, thanks. And definitely, uh, I'd like to talk about it afterwards. Sure. Any other questions? All right, All right, let's thank Ken again. <laughs>